storytelling is something that we've all done uh, or participated in since we were yay high. Um, but we might not have, have spent as much time really thinking about it and thinking about what makes um, a great storytelling. So hopefully we'll discover that some of that stuff today um, through me and hopefully you guys um, have some storytelling experiences you can share as well. Um, so I do a lot of these these uh, talks and then I do a lot of them for the corporate folks. And uh, the interesting thing about the, the corporate guys is a lot of them, they're not used to telling stories at work. That's not something they do, it's kind of foreign to them. Um, but I'm thinking most of you folks in the room and online are uh, in the nonprofit realm, so you actually are probably used um, to telling a lot of stories. Um, and and I was just talking to Lori right now just about all the storytelling events that are coming up around the world and everyone's getting into storytelling and it's kind of, uh, you could say for lack of a better word, a big fad right now. Everyone's talking about storytelling and how, you know, it'll do everything for you and help you meet all your goals and all that stuff. Um, may or may not be true. Um, but uh, the important thing to know about uh, storytelling is there is um, not all, all stories are created equal and there is the right story at the right moment and so that's what we're going to delve into a bit more today to figure out what the right stories um, might be for you guys as you're doing um, trying to meet some of your goals and um, so I am um, and actually I'm going to start off with a story that was told um, to me, and it was the right story at the right moment for me. Um, before I joined Strategic Storytellers, I spent six years uh, leading the online and social team at the World Wildlife Fund. So I come um, from the nonprofit realm. And folks, online, I will be taking a few drink breaks because my voice is a little crackly today. So if there's like a gaping pause in, in the talk, just imagine me drinking or I guess you can see me drinking yeah oh wow I've never done one of these online where they could actually see me and that's frightening but we won't think about that anyhow so I was um, at the World Wildlife Fund for over six years and uh, you know it was the right position for me at the time I'm a real big environmentalist so it was the right place to be um, but then I began to realize that if I really wanted to make big change in the world, that stories were a vehicle to do that. Um, so that's why I left and joined strategic storytellers um, to you know, really delve into the medium of storytelling. And uh, when I started there, that was when I got told the right story at the right time for me. Because I knew stories were really powerful, but it was more of a, an intuition thing. I didn't really always understand why they were more powerful. I just kind of had that instinct. And so when I started, uh, my colleague Barney, and Barney's uh, the guy on the screen smiling and holding the big fish. That's Barney. And so he's, uh, he helped start up strategic storytellers. And so he told me this story. And so I'd like to share it with you guys now as you guys, you're here, so you're probably interested in delving further down your adventures in storytelling. So I think this might be the right story at the right time for you guys as well. So um, he, this story takes place, well he was told this story. Barney went on a fishing trip with his best friend. They went out to BC. And you know, on, okay, I've never been on a fishing trip, so I shouldn't say you know on fishing trips. But from what I hear, yes, yeah, spent a lot of time sitting around talking and telling stories, right? So they didn't I don't know, have much else to do than that. So they're sitting around, and so Barney's friend said to him, so you started up this company, the storytelling company, so what kind of clients are you helping? And so Barney says, well, actually, we just started working with Fairmont. Hold it right there, Barney's friend says. Wait, I've got a story to tell you. So he proceeds to tell him his story, his story about Fairmont. And this is how it went. There was this elderly couple who lived in Ontario and it had been their life, lifelong dream to take an Alaskan cruise. This was their dream vacation. So they spent year after year saving up a little bit and saving up a little bit um, so that they could finally, in their retirement, get to go. 
and they had the money now, they booked their vacation, and it was actually the day before the cruise. And so the day before the cruise, they got on the plane, flew off to Vancouver, and checked into the Fairmont. With them, they, they had their two little fur children in tow with them, you know, in the bag. Um, and so they checked into the Fairmont, um, but unfortunately that night they found out that the cruise they were on didn't take dogs. So they were crestfallen. They were like, tomorrow we're going to have to turn around and just go back home and miss our trip. But the staff of the Fairmont says, you're crazy. You've been waiting for this trip forever. We're not going to let you miss this trip. Right. We're going to call around till we find a kennel that can take your two dogs for the week and you're going to go. So they called around and they called around and I don't know what's up. I don't know if there's anyone online from Vancouver, what's up with the kennels there? But there wasn't a suitable kennel to take these dogs for the week. So one of the young women who works behind the front desk, she said to her manager, you know, if you can change the schedule so that my roommate and her roommate also worked behind the front desk. If we can work separate shifts all week, then one of us can always be home and we can take the dogs. And the manager said, yeah, I can, I can make that happen, you know, no problem. So they presented this idea to the couple and I wasn't there, but I'm sure the couple was like, hmm, strangers looking after my, you know, pretty much children. Um, but you know, they were happy for the offer. So the next day, they left their little dogs behind and they set off on their cruise and they, they had that trip of a lifetime. It was a week that they will never forget. And so then they came back after their trip, checked back into the Fairmont and they're bounding down the hall with their little puppies, safe and sound and happy and they're all relieved and everyone's together again. And then the two women who looked after these dogs they presented the couple with a photo album. And on the cover of the photo album, it said, Tumbleweed and Sagebrushes Vacation in Vancouver. <laughs> so these women had taken the dogs everywhere. They took them running in Stanley Park. They took them sniffing around all the tourist locations. Um, they, they even organized a block, a, like a doggy block party where all the dogs in the neighborhood came and they had music and food. And they took pictures of all of this, put it in an album <coughs> and gave it to the couple. So not only did the couple know they had a great vacation, but they got to actually see that their dogs had a great vacation too. And so Fairmont's brand promise, and, and this is, I'm not telling you this because it's a great brand story, because Fairmont's brand promise is turning moments into memories. So that's exactly what these women did. And so it's, it's an awesome brand story to have. But what's really interesting to me about this story is that this story was first, the first time it was ever told was at a Fairmont employee engagement event where they actually honored these women for upholding the brand promise. And what's interesting is Barney's friend who told him the story he wasn't at that event. He doesn't know anybody who's involved in the story personally. And when he told Barney that story, it was over 10 years old. Yet, the first thing he thinks about when he thinks about Fairmont, right away, comes to his mind that story and those emotions. And so for me, this was the right story at the right time. Because not only was it inspirational, um, but it, and the funny thing is, whenever I, um, I've, I've told this story often, because it's really a great foundational storytelling story, and, and we'll, we'll talk about, look at it a bit more and talk about why, but I still get tweets and emails, you know, a year after I've told this story from people who say, when they're sitting down and thinking about their storytelling for their organization, this story still comes to mind for them, okay? And the reason is, is because it touches on some very valuable um, elements of storytelling. And so one of them is stories, great stories are memorable. Right? So I'm going to continue talking here for I don't know how long. Um, and you're probably not going to remember much of what I say beyond this. But tomorrow you probably will be able to remember that story and retell it to somebody. Right? And so stories uh, are unique and you can Google the science on it. Um, we've been telling stories even before we could talk because it was a mechanism of survival for us as humans. So we have a really, we save stories in our brains in a different way than we save other information. And we save it in a way that is quickly accessible and that kind of plants in our mind 
and keeps on replaying over and over. So if a story really inspires you, even after you've heard it, you go home and walk away and it kind of sits in your mind and replays and maybe you change it a little bit to make it suit you, you know, and you replay it over and over again. So that's the impact of stories. It'll be very memorable and it'll keep in your audience's mind long after you've told the story. Um, stories are also computer. Um, stories also show rather than tell. Okay, so I can tell you, Fairmont's brand promise is turning moments into memories. What does that mean, right? What does that mean until you can show it coming to life, as like in this story, and so that you can show what your your nonprofits do and make that really come to life for somebody, right? You can have a mission all you want, but until you show it to somebody and show it to someone in a story, will it really start to live and breathe? And it's like uh, another example um, is is if you think of the great um, the Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, and you think of Scrooge, and he's visited by the three ghosts in his bedroom. You know, Do the three ghosts come into his bedroom and say, you know, Scrooge, you're a miserable old man, you're leaving, leading a horrible little life, and you're ruining the lives of people around you, you know, do better, you know? No, they didn't say that, right? They just showed him. They showed him his past, his present, and his future. And by him being able to see those stories, he himself was able to come up with a conclusion that he wanted to make a change. Okay? And so that's what you want to do with storytellings um, for your nonprofits. You want people to able to hear your story and go, "Yeah, that is something I want to get involved with. You know, donate to, be a volunteer with." You want people to make um, that decision on their own. And so that's what stories can do. They can show rather than just tell. Um, stories. Are also trespassers. There should be a few dogs in this uh, presentation. And now, I hope you didn't feel that I was giving you a five minute Fairmont ad when I was telling you the story. Hopefully. And when the room felt that way. Um, because stories are very disarming. Um, you know when you get called by a telemarketer, you're faced with a salesperson, I don't know about you, but they start talking and I kind of back away and I have this wall and I'm not listening to what they're saying. I'm just waiting for that moment where I can interrupt and go, you know, no, not interested. I don't know what I'm not interested in, right? Because I'm not listening to them anymore. Um, but I put up that wall. But with stories, we put ourselves in an entertainment frame of mind and we lower our guard and we don't think that someone's trying to push something on us, right? So we don't think that you're trying to, you know, ask you to open your wallet and give out some money, right? You're entertaining me. I'm free, you know, I'm listening. And at the end of the story, I come again to my own conclusion that I want to donate. So stories really have that way of putting people in the right frame of mind. And when you can have a story also told about your organization by a third party, you know, if Fairmont, the CEO of Fairmont was up here telling you that story, it might feel a little different than me Fairmont's not a client of mine currently, um, FYI, a little bit of disclosure, and I'm just telling you that story as a friendly story. It has a different feel. So that's the power of stories for sure. But we all know stories are inspirational, right? We read books and we watch movies um, because, of, because of that. Um, and so for me, the, the um, Fairmont story sticks in my mind because it reminds me of the el good elements of a story being memorable and that they show um, and that they create that trust, that bond. Um, but the Fairmont story also sticks in my mind too because when I'm thinking, when I deal with my clients at Storytellers, I also think, okay, what more can I do for my clients to kind of wow them, you know? Like these women in the story went beyond um, to wow their clients. So it inspires me a bit too um, in that end. And you, if you think of any, any, you know, great charity, great brand that's, you know, we're all trying to sell something, um, you know. Uh, if you think of the great ones out there, if you think of Nike, Nike, they're not selling sports gear, 
right? They're selling that feeling, that feeling of um, that emotional story of, of, you know, our hard work and our sweat and our perseverance, right? So just do it isn't about Nike, it's about me and what I can do, right? So that's what they're selling to me, that emotional story of who I can be, right? And so that's what makes really great brands. And if you compare Nike to like Adidas and Reebok, they just don't have that emotional connection with their customers, right? Because they just don't have that story. Um, so that's really important to have that inspiration in your stories. And stories spread, okay? So, and case in point, I found that story is now more than 15 years old, 16, 17, I don't know, and it's spreading. You know, I tell it, I, you know, don't know Barney's friend. Um, people I've told it to are now telling people, and who knows where else it is, right, and where it might go. Um, so that's a great thing about stories to remember. And you have a great one, it will spread, and you don't know when the spreading will do something for you, but eventually it kind of comes full circle. So where are we going tonight? After that, a quick look at kind of the elements that make some great stories. Um, so, so again, you know, stories are really powerful. Um, and they can really help us meet our goals. Um, but first, we'll take a look at tonight how the wrong story can have an impact on you. So, you know, it's only the um, wrong stories can be just as uh, more damaging to you than, than anything else as well. So you want to make sure that we don't get caught telling the wrong story. And then we'll look at two types of stories that are really important as nonprofit that you want to think about. So we'll, we'll look at those stories, look at some examples, get to know the two most powerful stories that you guys have in your arsenal. Okay, so we talked about it, a story, a uh, wrong story for story's sake isn't good. So sometimes, you know, we know the power of storytelling and we have a campaign come up, coming up, so we're just trying to find that story that we can fit in there to, you know, make it make it magically better, right? Um, and, um, and we want to make sure that, that, that we, we are finding that story that will actually move our audience. Because if it's not moving that particular people that we're going after, then we've kind of wasted our breath, wasted our ink, um, and potentially wasted a good return on donations. So, so, the, I don't know if you guys, do you guys know the um, m and Strategic Services folks? You ever heard of them? You might want to check out, um, they're in small print at the bottom of the slide, but they do a lot of great reports. Uh, they have a great report on nonprofits and emailing and what works and what doesn't and, and that kind of stuff. So, I love these guys. These guys have also done some story tests. Um, so this is one test that they did. So they worked with a uh, national um, health organization. I'm assuming this is in the U.S. Uh, in this particular case, um, because so this health organization did um, sent out two email blasts to random groups of 300,000 each. Okay, and so one blast had version one of of their pitch, their campaign pitch, and the other one had version two. So version one they sent out to 300,000 people. Uh, you know, your general institutional approach. So, you know, what our organization is about, um, what we've accomplished, what the need is, why we need you to give. And then in the second version, they did a more personal approach. So they did a story around a young person who was, um, you know, diagnosed with a debilitating disease. So any thoughts on which approach might have raised more money for them? Okay, we got a little twos, we got some twos, got some twos, twos, one, we got one one in a sea of twos, twos. Okay, it's hard to tell when you can't actually see uh, the text of what they sent out, right? But in the wisdom, and I'll tell my clients version two would work better, um, actually version one, in this case, one out. And version one raised four times as much money as version two, from nearly twice as many donors. So perhaps they had the wrong story in there um, for the wrong, the wrong time, the wrong story, and you can see how that pretty much damaged their campaign, right? 
So any ideas, and again, we can't see it, I've never seen the text, uh, but any ideas why perhaps version two in this case didn't work out? Yes? Stories about death make people avoid it. Okay, so stories about death make people... Make people think of death. Yeah. People Makes people think of death, puts them in the wrong frame of mind, rather than trying to bring life to the world. We're thinking of death. Yeah, that's a good one. Anything else? Yeah, it could have been a sad story versus positive. So again, you don't want to leave your donors in a sen uh, state of helplessness, right? Um, so that's a good one in the back. Well, it's almost like that's how marketing. The sad stories are told so many times for so many years. People are just numb to it. Yeah. So yeah. So it's like a telemarketer. We've heard the sad story. There's a bajillion nonprofits out there, all with a bajillion sad stories, unfortunately, and we've heard them over and over again. So it might, we might get a little desensitized from it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, didn't properly integrate how it is that they're part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They might not have integrated how they are the solution <coughs> to uh, the problem that they're presenting. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. 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 There could have been a lack of honesty, and that really is uh, big storytelling. Again, if you just go out there and storytell for story's sake, and you don't truly believe and feel in the story yourself, that will come through. Um, sure. It could have been transparently manipulative, like very easily easy to see that it was purposely made to manipulate your emotions. Yeah, could have been made to manipulate your emotions, and that's it. People will sense a mile away if you're just trying to get a tear out of them, right? Um, and they sense that, they feel that, it's not genuine, um, and it turns people off, for sure. Okay, yeah? You know, like you presented us with a, a list of uh, significant story attributes, and you could deduce that maybe version two was weak on, on one or more design yeah. attributes, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we really want to take a look at the stories that we tell and measure them against uh, those attributes, and we'll even look at some more attributes. We lots of attributes we can look at. We'll get some more later today as well. Um, and, and really judge our stories uh, against that, um, I think, is, is really important. Um, yeah, so lots of good points and could be a whole bunch of other things. Again, um, we weren't there, but... I guess, and, and they did more tests like this too with, with other organizations and some similar results, again, when it was the wrong story. So we don't want to fall in the, into the personal story trap. And um, so we just don't want to tell a story, hear ourselves tell a story, right? We want to consider if it's a story that will be of interest um, to the people we're telling it to. And, um, and we talked about, we want to be genuine, um, we don't want to just, uh, you know, some great stories or tear jerkers and that's fine, but make sure you're just not trying to pull the tears just for the sake of it. And then make sure that um, you don't want people to be, yeah, as we talked about, left, like, powerless. It's a huge problem. There's nothing I can do. Or this person has already died. What am I going to do? You know, I can't save this person anymore. And if you don't lead them on to, you know, the opportunity that they have, that that one person, and again, it's about, you're talking to one person who's reading your story. You know, it might be 100,001 people, but it's one person. So that one person has to feel that they're empowered to be able to do something. So if you don't give them a solution, you know, and now give me 10 bucks, but like the world's coming to an end. You know, uh, I, 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 that's not, you know, I would give you my 10 bucks, but that's not going to solve the, you know, the world coming to an end. So I need to feel that I can give my money and I'll make some uh, really good contribution to what you are doing. Um, so that's all really important to consider. Um, okay, so your best stories. So, you know, when you're fundraising or trying to get volunteers, to you know, join a board and, and donate their time. You know, so whether you're writing emails or you're um, sending mailings, you're soliciting people in person, um, social media, create Facebook landing pages, you know, whatever you might be uh, creating, you want to think of two types of story architects that are really important. So there's the explaining story. Okay? And in explaining story, you want to illustrate a point 
or uh, paint a vivid picture of something very, uh, a particular situation. You might have a, uh, lots of times we have uh, statistics, um, some fact, and you want to take that fact and actually bring it to life. So you want to explain it and, and bring life to that fact. Um, and so these stories are really good at grabbing people's attention and making people go, oh, I want to know more. <coughs> but explaining stories in themselves don't actually compel someone to act. Okay, so that's really important to consider. So if you really want someone to jump off their couch and give you money right now, or you want them to volunteer right now, um, the explaining story isn't you know, your right now story. But your explaining story is something that you can use to grab people's attention and go, I need to know more about this nonprofit. I need to know more about how, you know, I'm not compelled to help, but maybe if I had some more information, I might be, so I might want to delve further into it. So when you have an explaining story, you catch people's attention, and you make sure that you give them some more that they can delve into um, now or later as they're interested. But then your uh, compelling donor-centric story, that's the type of story that gets people to act. And um, so a story like that um, offers, offers, offers your listener an opportunity to say something about themselves. So if I act on this, this means something about me, right? I am this type of person. And we'll take a look a bit more in detail on, on kind of what that means. So you want to set your donor up as the hero of the story. Someone, the donor is someone who can come in and make a difference. Okay, so in these types of stories, your organization isn't the hero, okay? It's your donor. Your donors, and specifically donor, that particular person sitting right there in that chair, listening to your communication, they're the hero um, who can make something happen. So you want to speak to the, you want to make them the hero, you want to speak to the impact that one person can make. Okay, so again, we talked about that story before that failed. Perhaps, you know, it said something like, you know, 100,000 kids a year are dying of this horrible disease. Woo, big, horrible problem, sad, you know, donate now. Well, you know, how am I going to help s save 100,000 kids who are dying of you know, this thing that we don't even know what the cure is for, right? Um, so, so you really, so we'll look at some donor-centric stories so you get a picture of that. But first, let's look at some explaining stories. And so, here is um, an explaining story. So let me read it out loud for everyone. Nesting season for sea turtles is always fraught with danger from threats like entanglement in fishing gear and habitat degradation. But this year, see how turtles must also face the fallout from the worst oil spill in history. Okay, so that explained, explained something about turtles and oil. Now here's a different version of it. Same story, but um, a little different take. Getting caught in fishing gear is bad enough, but this year, sea turtles faced a much more horrifying threat, dirty, sticky oil from the worst oil spill in history. So to me, that story starts showing. Starts showing me, I can s dirty, sticky oil. I've seen it on the news. I can almost feel it. I can almost, I can almost see, ooh, I wouldn't want to be in cotton, dirty, sticky oil, you know, that would be horrible. And then, then thinking of the poor, helpless turtle who can't really do anything about their situation. So it starts, to me, painting a bit of more of a picture of what's going on. Unlike if we go back to the other story, it had a lot of, it was a little longer, which we all know is, is generally never good, the shorter the better, often. Uh, it had a lot of big words that really didn't mean much. It didn't, that didn't paint any picture in my mind. So we had fraught and uh, entanglement and degradation and turtles must also face the fallout from turtles facing a fallout. What does that mean? You know, I don't know. I can't see it. Are they falling off cliffs? I don't know. Um, so, you know, a lot of great words that, you know, if you delve into it and, yeah, spend some time thinking on what habitat degradation is, you know, it's a horrible thing and it has, you know, I've been there, I know, but it really doesn't um, paint as, as nice 
and picture that I can now visually see you know turtles getting caught in fishing gear and now in this sticky horrible oily mess um, so that to me kind of gets my attention I can see it and I might be interested in finding um, out some more about it um, now I'm going to show you a video in a sec and so this video is another explaining story this charity called 100,000 Homes anybody heard of these guys? okay so they're uh, homeless homelessness and now I recall every presentation I do and I talk about homelessness um, I can't say the word very well um, okay so they're a homeless charity and their goal is it's pretty simple it's built into their name they want to get 100,000 people off the street into homes which is great so with this video it's an explaining story and it does a couple of things it takes the the fact, they're, they're not the fact, the stat, their name, and it brings it to life a bit more. 100,000 homes. And then what it also does is it brings the issue of homelessness down to something, three things that are really simple on a human scale. Three things I can wrap my head around as an individual and go, yeah, okay, I understand. Now, who here works in a charity or homeless? You guys know so much about it, and it's such a complex issue with so much to it. It's not as easy and black and white as, you know, getting someone into a home off the street. But at the same token, me, who has a day job, and I know all the ins and outs of whatever my day job is, I don't have time, brain power, to really understand the full issues of homelessness. So if you can break it down into something that's easier for me to get my head around, um, it'll be easier for me to jump on board with your charity. And I'll tell you, this story, again, it's an explaining story. Personally, it hasn't gotten me to act in any way. But I will tell you, without a doubt, this story replays in my mind at least five times a week. I work in um, Toronto. Like, King and Duffer, and so it's a happening area with lots of creative folks in it, but it's also an area of a lot of homeless people and uh, low-income people and people with a lot of need in our city. And so each day as I walk the streets to and from work and I encounter these people, I now think of them in a totally different light than I used to. It's because of this story, it's replayed in my mind, and I've now made it my own and it's changed my perspective on the world. One day, I'm assuming that'll lead to some action. But for now, it's sitting there and it's thinking, making me think um, every day. So we are going to get ready and play this video.
powerful in a few ways. For me, it's powerful in that it took the issue down to see three simple things, a locked door, a warm bed, and a chair, which was a surprise to me. But then I thought, wow, you know, how much thinking and life change do you do in a chair? You do a lot. Um, so it brought it down to something that, that I could understand and wrap my arms around. But then what it did for me too is it literally changed the face of hopeless, homelessness for me. Um, I now walk around and I see folks on the street and I think what potential there is if they had the right chance, right? Because in, in that video I see my family, I see my friends, my colleagues in that video, right? Um, so given, given the chance, um, you know, they're not homeless people, they're people you know, in need of some help and could, you know, contribute a lot to society. Anyway, so that story literally plays in my head all the time, everywhere I walk in Toronto. So I think that's pretty powerful um, as an explaining story. Anyone here from the Young Street Mission? Good. Um, so I recently, maybe a year ago, inherited some mail from, uh, from someone else. And so I was getting, I don't know why, but I was getting campaigns mailed to me from the Young Street Mission. And big white envelope, so, you know, it's a charity, I know they spent money getting this to me, you know, I'm obliged, I feel I should open it. You know, so I open it, eh, look through it, and it goes in the recycle. So by the third time I got one of these, being an environmentalist, <gasps> can't stand getting this paper and it going to waste, and they're wasting their money, you know, on this. So, okay. And so, for me, the Young Street Mission, when I went to school, I went to school close to the Young Street Mission. So I walk by often. And to me, I walk by, I saw a lot of teenagers hanging out, probably homeless teenagers or disadvantaged teenagers, and I thought, oh, they're probably there to get teenagers off the street and educated. Yeah, that's what it seemed like to me. That's what I thought the Young Street Mission was for. So anyway, so I went on their website to cancel the mailings, and I saw a button stories of change. I'm like, well, that's calling out to me. So I had to click on it. And right away, without reading the word, I saw they had five, six stories at least. And the first, at least three, were stories of middle-aged women. And right away, you know, again, my perception of them was helping teenagers do something or other, right? So I saw stories of middle-aged women. So right away, my impression of them changed. And there's a URL there, if it if uh, bitly.yms, uh, Young Street Mission Stories, if you go there and go to this page and read some of these stories, so well written, short, nice, concise, but so well written and they immediately give me the picture of what kind of services the Young Street Mission does and what a difference they're making in people's lives that I never knew. So just from a few seconds of reading, my whole impression of them has changed. Now, for environmental purposes, I still did cancel the mailings. But yet, I'm primed now. Next time I see something coming somewhere from them, my eyes are open, and I'm going to take a second look. Okay? So that's explaining stories. They kind of open people's eyes for you and get them kind of half primed to maybe take the next move next time. Um, so then, your donor-centric stories. So here's one I'll read. Uh, your membership gift right now could decide whether we see new federal assaults on equality and new bans on same-sex couples marrying, or whether millions of couples will have their love recognized for the first time. Okay, So that's a donor-centric story in that you're putting your donor right in the middle of it, and they can be the hero of the story. And it's actually, they have no choice now but to decide whether they donate well, or not. They have no choice now to kind of take a stand. Basically, if they help, they are, you know, for love and for people being happy. Or if they don't help, there'll be new assaults and new, you know, inequalities and all that, and they're going to be on the side of, of that happening, right? It's going to be on their backs. So really, by putting your donor right here, you're making them say something about themselves. Am I for or am I against this? And if I'm for, how can I not do something to help stop it, right? Um, so that's pretty powerful when you uh, kind of make people have to make that conscious decision for themselves. Um, now when I was at uh, WWF, similar type of thing that we did. We, um, I don't work there anymore, but I still like to know because no one does. 
who puts on, you know, the event Earth Hour happens every March, you turn on off your lights for, who's responsible for Earth Hour? David Suzuki, the, eh, eh. we won't go there, uh, WWF, okay. So they're the ones who started that event a long, long time ago, 2008 to be specific. So, um, so they spearheaded that event. And so in 2008, 2009, in Canada, we ran the event and it, very successful in the way that, you know, half of adult, all Canadian adults uh, turned off their lights for the hour. Bonus. But, you know, but that's not what we were really, really after. What we wanted is participation uh, all year round and after the event, right? So every year after the event, we'd say, woohoo, you guys are awesome. You turned out your lights, you made a stand. Um, now, join our, you know, we did a little sexier than this, but join our online community of people who are lowering their carbon footprint. Okay, yes, we did do it a little sexier than that. Um, and pledge to take an action to further reduce and help the planet. And so every year, we got about two, two, three hundred people to sign up to our community after Earth Hour. Okay, ten million people in Canada turning off their lights, two, three hundred joining <coughs> our community. That's okay. Um, so the third year, what we did is we said, um, so people, before Earth Hour, people were pledging to do Earth Hour. Yeah, I'm going to do it this year. Woohoo, exciting. I'm planning the board games and all that stuff. Got the candles ready. And we said to them, we said, well, we told them who they were. We said, you know, because you participate in Earth Hour, you're an environmentalist. You're doing more than most people are in the world. I don't know that. We don't know that. All I know is you probably turn off your lights for an hour. You know, that does not make you an environmentalist. But let's just assume. Um, and so by telling people who they are, they now feel they have to act that way, right? You put a mirror up in their face and said, you know, you're an environmentalist. And they're like, yeah, I am. So maybe I should, you know, I'm getting rid of that SUV and blah, blah, blah. So you kind of put people into the story, make them feel that they are a certain way. So we did that. So we are environmentalists, so we want you to join our community and publicly tell the world what you are doing to make the world a better place. Right? So we turned it around, instead of, you know, pledge to take an action and do more, we said, be that person who shows the world that you're doing something and making a difference. So um, this community who had that we had this community going for two years, and in two years we got 20,000 people to join the community, including those couple hundred each Earth Hour. Well, in six weeks during that Earth Hour, we, we got over 20,000 to join the community. So we more than doubled the community in six weeks just by reframing it for people and put, making them part of the story, right? and making them stand up and say, yeah, I'm part of that story, that's who I am. Um, and then they acted that way. And further, uh, for us geeks who want to see if this really made a difference, we then, you know, years later, surveyed all our people in our community. And those people who joined, those 20,000 who joined during Earth Hour, they were the ones who were the most um, excited about the community, and they were the most feeling that they should be doing even more than they were already, and gung-ho to, you know, take on more challenges. Because they had made that public statement, we made them make that public statement, they saw themselves as part of that story, and now they wanted to live it um, even more. So that was uh, really powerful on just how reframing it for them kind of made a whole difference. Now, I'll show you another video. Um, and so this one, donor-centric story, so again, it's a homeless charity uh, called Invisible People. Anyone heard of that one? Wow, one person, okay. That's even smaller charity, two people. Um, okay, so this is this is uh, an awesome charity. Again, very small, no money, hardly. Um, and what they're doing is they're going around the states and Canada filming, letting homeless people tell their stories. And what's really interesting about this is, so in a donor-centric story, you want to make your donor the hero and make them the center of the story. And that's not always possible. I realize that. Um, so sometimes you do have to tell the stories of the people you are helping, as in this case. Um, 
but you want to do it in a way that again shows that one person that they can make a difference and you want that person to be able to relate to the person in your story so again going ab back to the story that kind of failed of uh, you know the young person who had a debilitating disease I'm sure definitely what they didn't do is there was nothing in that story for me or whoever they were targeting to relate to to that person so I don't know who they were targeting but I probably just didn't feel it this particular story um, you may or may not uh, relate to but it, think about it so Robert he's homeless and he's going to tell his story and he gives so much information about him that I go yeah I'm like that or I know someone like that or I could you know totally relate to what he's saying even though you know I think Lee have never been at all in his situation um, so that's really powerful what they've done here so they're making it relatively simple um, for me to understand and see how I can help and Robert really does an awesome job at making me relate to him so we'll play this one and we're ready to go Robert we're here in Sacramento you're homeless living in a tent city tell me about it yeah, I was in the first tent city I found housing after 18 months in Sacramento self-help and that all folded in and I was homeless prior to tent city June 15, 2007, I worked for a property management for four and a half years. Came with housing, I had 72 hours to get off the property, and I became homeless. Well, after 18 months that I spent with Sacramento Self Help and Tent City, the first Tent City closed, I lost my housing, and I've been out here ever since. Um, they just gave us notices to move I'm not out here because this is my lifestyle I don't have anywhere else to go uh, I have a dog that was neglected and uh, I've become attached to the dog and I don't know where else to go right now I don't want to give up the dog they gave out notices so that we could have shelter 50 beds for 150 people and it doesn't include your, your, your pets so well, how are they going to fit 150 people in 50 beds? It's the same thing every year. They never do. So I don't know what else to do. I've gotten three. I was out here eight months the second time and never got a ticket. Last month, I got three tickets in one week. And I came over to this side trying to be a part of safe ground or the independent people out here. And I haven't received no tickets. Uh, how much is the fine? I don't know yet. I've never had one before. I know on the fourth one, they're telling us that it's a felony. So if I get one more, I'm going to go to felony for, for pitching a tent and have, you know, having nowhere to, to sleep. My, uh, I've had a heart attack since then. I'm trying to get to the doctor. You know, and I'm ready to lost the dog. I'm sorry. So uh, anyway, I'm not, I don't want to be out here. I don't have anywhere to go. 55 years old next January 5th. I got a lot of good friends out here. There's some bad with the good like there is anywhere else. But we just don't have nowhere to go. Speaking for myself personally, I don't have no family. Uh, I have nowhere else to go, so I never thought I'd end up on Skid Row out like here sleeping on docks and back of businesses and everything, but that's what I guess I'm going to have to do. I don't know. Um, yeah. If you had three wishes, what would they be? For everybody to have a place to stay. Yeah, I love you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's so more for some of you got for us to stay where we can gather our thoughts and think about what we can do. Okay, so that's Robert's story. Um, and so the beauty of what these folks are doing is they've told stories of folks in Calgary and 
if you live in Sacramento, you probably know exactly where he is. And you know he's right there around the corner from you, and you now see this one person who's struggling. That's something manageable. I don't exactly know maybe exactly how I'm going to help him. That's something manageable that I can, you know, it's right here in my community that I can get my arms around and maybe try to help him. And that's exactly what's happened in Calgary. I know people and community groups have rallied around some of the people that they've interviewed um, and helped them off the street. Now, whether they're going to go forward and do more than just help one or two people off the street, you know, I don't know, and I, I don't know if that's exactly uh, the, the target of this charity. But um, at any rate, so it's very personal because it's very location-based. You know, they're right there right now in your community. And then Robert does great things. Um, he shares so much about him that at least one thing or another will twig you. So whether a lot of people have fear of losing their job and losing everything, okay, and it's a hard economic time right now, so people have experienced this, they've seen family experience, or it's one of their big fears. And this is exactly what's happened to him, right? He lost a job and he lost everything. So we all feel that we could, that could be us. So we're more likely to help. Um, he talks, if you're a pet lover, he talks about the dog he rescued and that he can't take with him and all that stuff. So that's, you get pet lovers going. Um, he talks about his heart attack. So again, if you've dealt with a major medical issue in the comfort of your own home, you know how traumatic and hard that is. Imagine doing that on the street, right? He talks about how old he is, when his birthday is. So all these things that someone might find to relate to him and feel that, you know, that could be them and therefore when you see it could be you, you know, you want to help. So that's some great things of a donor-centric story where the donor's not actually in the story, uh, but they could see how they might be able to help and they can relate to the person uh, who's in that story. Um, so I think that's um, pretty cool what they did. Okay, so we started tonight. We looked at some elements that make a great story. Uh, we've talked about explaining stories and donor-centric stories and what they can do for you. Um, so just um, reiterate some of the tips. So again, explaining stories are to get people interested in you or your issue. So if I've never really thought about the environment before, you can do an explaining story that kind of opens it up a different picture for me that gets me more on board or gets me to understand your organization or who you're helping a bit more. Um, you can bring, you know, nonprofits. We have great statistics, horrible statistics. We can bring those uh, to life with an explaining story. And get pe it's basically about getting people to want to know more. Okay? And that might be right away. I want to know more. Give me that website. I got to read. Or again, it might be a great story that sticks with them and replays in their mind. And at some point, they will dial in and find out more. Uh, then your donor-centric story um, so is to, is to get people to take action, okay? Get a certain group of people to take action right now, and they need to see themselves in the story, whether they see other donors like them or they see people uh, you're helping but they relate to them. Um, and again, they feel empowered from this story. They feel that I can do something uh, to make um, something better. Okay, so again, we talked about making sure your story is memorable. So don't just tell a story if you don't think it's gonna stick. Uh, but be genuine about it. So we t we great. I'm glad we brought this up early. Don't just do the you can do the tearjerker stories, but don't just do them just to um, create tears because that leaves people uh, pow feeling powerless. Right? You need to end them off on something where they feel they can make use of their emotions. And bringing it down to the human scale, um, you know, and you've probably all heard the whole, you know, I don't even know the statistics, but you know, 20 million children starving in Ethiopia, horrible, nothing I can do about it. It's huge, right? But if you tell me about little 10-year-old Anuba, who's now looking after her little brothers and sisters in their dirt hut because their parents are gone. I can imagine her and her looking after her sisters, and I feel that that's something that maybe I can contribute to, right? 
and you really want to make it visual and show. So again, we look at some of those text examples of the turtles and the oil, kind of it was rewritten in the second version, just kind of made it a little more visual in my mind and kind of starts the story. You don't always have to tell the whole story. It's by kind of getting the story started in someone's mind and they will take it further. Um, they will take it in the direction that they want to, uh, that works for them and you know ties into what you're doing. Okay, so how are we all doing? My God, you guys are awesome. So, I'm going to take a breath, and we'll look at just quickly two more um, sections, um, and um, and we'll open up to some questions, but also I'd like to hear some experiences uh, about perhaps some stories that you've used and you've seen good things or, or not so good things happen because of them. So I think that sharing um, will really help us. So first, though, um, we'll take a look at um, finding your stories. So just some thoughts on how you might be able to find your stories. And um, and then how you can um, use them uh, a bit. So just some tips on um, just kind of some social media tips, but not really social media. It's kind of like the social the tips for the social times. Um, but anyway, so where to look for your stories. So it's hard to sit in a room all by yourself and find a story, right? So stories by nature, it's about talking to people. So talk to people in your organization who've just started, who've been there forever, and find out what makes, what stories make them get up in the morning and come do the long hours that you guys spend doing your jobs, right? So what is it that motivates them? So there could be uh, great nuggets in there that you've never heard of before um, that you'll find. So talk to people in your organization. Talk to your, um, you know, your sponsors. Why, you know, why are they helping sponsor your work? Talk to your donors, your stakeholders, your board. And the more you talk, the more people talk to you, you never know what nuggets uh, might come up from there. Um, so that's a lot of times, you know, I find we, we feel as a communications people, we gotta come up with stories. Um, but usually when we talk to people around us, that's where we'll find the stories. And of course, if you have a customer service team, um, they often um, have all those great letters and pictures and stories that come in. So Then if you're having no luck there, you're a small team, and you've talked to everybody and really not coming up with something, um, then often um, for those nonprofits who are really great with data, is look at the data. Look at your data. Look at it in a different light. Look at for something the secret to a great story is it's very simple. The Fairmont story is simple. You know, couple, dream trip, had a hurdle because they couldn't, you know, find a place for the dogs. That got settled. They had their dream trip. They came back and, you know, for forever indebted to Fairmont, you know, for what they did. So stories are very um, simple. So look at, find a really interesting part to your data that you've never really looked at before. So find a little nugget. And um, as an example, um, I don't know, what, I think they still have it, but um, on Apple, Apple's website, they have a section on their carbon footprint. Believe it or not, whatever, whatever. But uh, when you go there, they kind of diagram out the five buckets where you know they're emitting uh, carbon. So manufacturing, transportation, um, end user electricity use, and that's what makes up the carbon footprint. Okay, that helps me see it a little better. But then, and again, talking to the right audience, not all audiences might know this, but someone who's actually took the time to go look at their carbon footprint page, who cares about the environment, they had something, a little nugget of data that just kind of opened it up for me. And they showed um, a box. And it was a box that they shipped their first iPhone in. Show the box. And they, they showed like four airplanes, five airplanes. And they said, you know, when we shipped our first iPhone, it took like, you know, five airplanes times, you know, a bajillion. But, you know, as a scale, five airplanes to ship these across the world to people. And then they showed me a smaller box where their 2010 iPhone or what have you came in. And then they showed two and a half airplanes that it took to fly these things around the world. And knowing something about the environment, I know airplanes, bad, 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 
bad, bad, bad, right? It's the worst thing you could do. So just showing that size, putting that story together, quick visual on taking a little nugget of data and showing what it was doing, you know, changed the world and the picture for me. And that's something that still is in my mind um, every day. So again, you might want to find a little interesting nugget of data that you have and go, why is that data so? <laughs> and you might know the answer when you look into it or you might go and ask your colleagues, you know, why did this blip happen um, in our data? Why, you know, did we have so much more of something, some less of something? And someone might be able to tell you the story of, you know, how that particular data, weird data point came to be. And that could be really um, a rich thing that you can use. So look at your data a little more. Um, and then um, when you think you have a story that you think hmm, maybe it could, be, could be good, you want to find fat. Is there enough fat in this story? So fat, passion. Is there any passion in the story or is it just a story? The story has a beginning, middle, and end. Also, you've got a big beginning and middle. Was there any passion? Is there anything at stake that really matters in this story? There's nothing at stake here. There's no passion. There's nothing exciting. It's not really a story worth telling. Okay? So make sure you stand on the edge a bit more and find a story that has something uh, in it. Okay? Your story has to have a hero. Preferably a compelling donor-centric hero, but it has to have a hero, someone who's trying to achieve something, right? So make sure, again, stories are about people. People care about people. Um, even when you're in the animal charities, people care about people. Um, so find uh, the person, persons in strength. Um, and then you need an antagonist, which is a person, a company, or just something, some obstacle that comes in the way. There's no obstacle in your story. Boring. Have you ever seen a Hollywood movie that didn't have an obstacle? Right? So you have to have that obstacle, the thing that gets in the way from doing the right thing or getting to where I want to go. Right? Okay. And then the key, the last part of fat, P-H-A-T, is transformation. Okay? Your hero has to transform at the end of, it's, it's a journey where they're trying to overcome this obstacle. Has anything transformed? Has anything changed? They may or may not achieve their goal. Doesn't matter so much, but what have they learned from it? Um, have things changed? Okay. So you need to can take your story and uh, put it up against the fat principles and see if you have that passion and that obstacle and that transformation. Okay. And those are the things that make a story that we all want um, to listen to. So um, lastly, in using your story, um, so as I said before, uh, my background um, before storytellers was uh, online and social media. And um, I was kind of telling Lori this before, my feeling is, I mean, stories have been around, as I said, before we could talk, they've been around forever. You know, since you were two and you're listening to great stories, we love great stories. Um, but even more today, we're more educated. We, we understand we are, you know, we won't take the same old fluff messages, the same old, we've heard, give me money a bajillion times. Um, so we need to really be, um, go out there and be authentic in what we're trying to say. And so in order to be able to be a storyteller, written, live, anyway, for your organization, you gotta have to know two things. You have to know your organization's story as a whole. What does your organization stand for? And really, what does it stand for? And you have a mission? Look at that mission a little more and understand what that really means. And, um, and for me, uh, and, uh, just a little aside, and the lightning thing for me, I was at, um, my husband did a lot of volunteering for the Cancer Society. So they had a volunteer lunch, so I went with him, we had lunch. Uh, their presentations. And one thing they said that really stood out to me is that they don't hire anyone who smokes. And the first thing I thought, is that legal? Um, which I still don't know if it is. <laughs> but, um, but again, you know, you got to make a stand. If that's who you are as a charity, you've got to live and breathe who you are and know your story, right? So you got to stand up for that for that. So we really got to live and breathe who we are as an organization in order to be able to go out and genuinely, gen, genuinely, gen, 
you know, tell our story transparently. And then we also have to know what our own story is. Okay? So why are we at this organization? What does it mean to us? To me? And it's, it's not that you necessarily will be, you know, always telling your own story, but you got to understand where your, com your organization is coming from and where you're coming from and why you are in order to be a really great transparent storyteller. Okay? So there's some work there and some thinking uh, that we have to do to really succeed, to really under understand that. And then we need to practice our stories. Okay? And preferably not on our donors unless they're, you know, a donor we have a great relationship with and we want to practice on. But you got to start practicing your stories on yourself in your mirror and your family and your friends. You know, so the next time someone asks you what to do, what you do for a living, yeah, well, yeah, you know, I raise money. I'm a development for uh, environmental charity. You know, go for it. Go bigger than that, right? Tell them a bit more, and they'll be interested. If they don't work in nonprofit, you've seen it before. You know, they all want to work in nonprofit, right? They might not quite know what that is, but they want to go out and save the world and do bigger and better things. And you guys are living the dream, right? So you want to express that story, and and when you tell your story more, especially when you start start doing it face to face on people that you know, safe people, you get to see the reaction that's important thing that's what heart is hard when we're writing our donor letters or doing social media we don't get to see the reactions so you want to see what really jives people but you know you don't know so much about what you do and all the issues and you're probably bogged down with all the red tape and everything that you know you need to do to solve your issue um, and so sometimes you lose sight of what's important so as you tell your story to other people you'll see when their eyes, you know, lighten up and they're like really interested in X and you're thinking to yourself, like, X? I mean, I'm doing this! You know, huge, big, I'm going to the government tribunal and, you know, whatever, but you're talking about, you know, some other little thing and their eyes lighten up, right? So you want to take those sparks and remember what those sparks are and expand on them, okay? So it takes time to practice your story. Once you know your story and your organization's story and you practiced it in person on people informally, uh, it will make you put you in a much better position to start telling more stories for your organization. And um, so because we're kind of technology frame here at TechSoup, um, so I'm guys, I'm sure you guys, you know, have come probably to some social media um, seminars, and so you may have heard this already. But um, I will kind of reiterate quickly. In social media, you're not talking to the masses. You're talking to one person. So when you're, you know, sending an email or updating a Facebook page or whatever, think about the fact that you're having a conversation across the table from someone. Okay? You can't see them. You're like blindfolded. You can't see. It's like a blind date. You can't see the person. Um, but think of yourself as having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Okay, and so that's how stories are shared one on one. If you can have that feeling as you're communicating, you'll be uh, much more successful. And um, another thing, as you know, you go out and tell your stories, and and so I mean, social media is a, a great place to be able to continually and continuously tell your story over time. Um, and if you really want to make kind of headway doing that. Don't try again to tell a story to the masses. Figure out a few select handful of people who are really inf could be influential to your organization. Or pick one of your donors who, you know, if you had five of their donors exactly like him, like life would be great. So go out and talk to that person or um, talk, talk A directly to that person um, or just talk you know, generally out there, but as if you were talking to that one type of donor, okay? And that's how you will attract other people like them, okay? So again, whenever you're on social media, try to remember um, a handful of people that you might be talking to who will be really influential to you uh, and what you do and speak as if you were speaking to them um, in person. And you don't need, you know, you don't need to to uh, excite 100,000 people online, right? Your charity probably needs another 10, 20, 100 awesome donors, right? 
Um, so start with a handful of influencers or donors, or it could be if you're doing policy, it could be government folks or journalists or what have you. Pick a select handful of people that you'd want to communicate with online and share your stories and information and help them achieve their goals online. And by doing talking to those people directly, you will, by nature, bring in more people um, like them. Okay, and listen. Okay, uh, there's there's another dog. I think we have one more to go. Um, and listen. So again, with, with social media, telling your story, it really shouldn't be storytelling. It should be story sharing, right? You want to be able to, um, unlike kind of what we've done today, we haven't shared too many stories, but um, we will hopefully soon. Um, it's about telling your story in order to engage someone else to share theirs. And once you get someone sharing their story, they're more engaged with you, they feel a tighter connection with you, and it's kind of that circle. So again, you want to be listening to those handful of people that you think are really important for you to talk to, um, listen to them, make a good first impression, um, like you would in person, you know, in person if you meet a potential great donor for the first time, you're not going to be slouching and looking down, right? You know, you will make that impression. So again, on the mind, think of making, how would you want someone to connect with you, right? And talk t with you. So make sure you do that. So don't hide behind, don't hide behind the computer. And again, give to those people. So give them stories that can create, um, add value to their life and uh, give them that ear for you to listen. So again, find those handful of people and give them what you can that they will find uh, valuable. And that's really how you do it. Um, one person on at a time online, but uh, when you impress one person online, you've generally impressed a lot more. So the idea with storytelling is to be memorable. Okay? So give people a snapshot of you and who you are and your work that they cannot forget. And so the final slide is um, for those who uh, really want to delve in further is, is a list of books. And um, these are uh, more, I will say, geared corporately. But it really is, you, you guys, Unlike corporate folks who don't always understand nonprofits, you guys understand what it means in it for you guys to tick. So you can take the concepts in these books and turn them around into what's needed for your organization. The first book, uh, Made to Stick, is really about you have a message that's really important that you want to get out and you want people to listen to. How can you make that stick for them? And it's a wonderful book with stories and strategies on how to do that. Um, and it's a fun read because it has so many great stories in it um, that uh, that in and of itself I think uh, would just be fun and very informative and kind of guide some, some thinking as you guys go forth and do more of your storytelling. So, here you are. Here we are. It's Tuesday night. I'm still so glad you guys came out. Awesome. Um, so, anyone want to start us off with uh, storytelling, ex a story, if you have a story, that'd be awesome, but storytelling experience on something that you've tried and you feel has worked really well, um, or perhaps not uh, lived up to what you'd hoped? Yeah. Awesome. Who's you? Um, it's not really a story, it's more of an experience, but it's always kind of, um, it always kind of surfaces when you talk about storytelling. So, when I was young, as many as... Did you want to maybe come up to the mic? No, no, I definitely want to. Oh, come on. No, 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 don't come up to the mic. Come up and, and look at me. Look at me in the eye and tell me your story. So when I was young, every Saturday night as a child, I used to sit on the couch with my father and my brother and we would watch Hockey Night in Canada. Who did you cheer for, though? I had absolutely no interest in hockey whatsoever. <laughs> so, but I was sort of forced to sit there on Saturday night and watch hockey. And I probably did this for 10 years. And if someone asked me what the rules of hockey were, I had no idea. I couldn't tell you other than maybe get the fucking net. 
But it wasn't until my son started playing hockey that I literally learned the game in probably an hour. And so it's just, to me, it's always interesting how unless we are genuinely interested in something, we can be exposed to it for a very long period of time and really absorb nothing. So from, I run, a, I manage a social enterprise, I mean, it's initiatives. So for me, I think the challenge has always been, rather than sort of the spray and pray rule, which is kind of just trying to tell the story to anyone who will listen, how do you kind of find who is genuinely interested in what we're doing and target those people that, like you were saying, I think the last bit of advice was really meaningful for me, um, just around sort of, you know, finding a handful of people rather than trying to tell a story to everyone. So, and that kind of hockey night in Canada thing really seems to help For sure. For sure, that, that's, that's awesome, and I'll just recapture capture that very poorly. Uh, it was a great story uh, for the online folks, but basically is, um, you're from Eva's Initiatives, your name? My name is Alexandra. Alexandra from Eva's Initiatives. Spend your childhood, a decade or more, watching Hockey Night in Canada at home, but ha because she had no interest, she learned nothing about the game. Not even that the Montreal Canadiens are the best team to cheer for. But, um, <laughs> um, but when it was relevant to her, when her son started playing hockey, in an hour she knew the ins and outs of the game because now it was relevant to her and it meant something. So exactly what we're talking about is telling a story that would be relevant to someone uh, in order for them to now open their eyes um, to what our charities are doing. And so then you ask then how do we find uh, these people and yeah I mean it is uh, definitely tricky um, but I think it's it's sort of a um, it's one begets another. So look a little closer at the people you have gotten, and if you can find out why they are participating in your charity, uh, might enlighten um, us a bit more on you know why they came to you. And then again, there's more of those people where those people came from. I mean, I know it's it's pretty generic but again especially if you do do a lot of communications online if you can start uh, in encouraging and talking with those people and sharing stuff that those people who are already committed to your organization are interested in they know other people like them that they will then share something interesting and that's valuable and that one at a time spreads your network and then they know somebody so if you can delight a handful of people online like truly delight them they will find you other people just like them. Um, um, but you really, you know, you want to delight and wow them and become something that they can't ignore and something that uh, you've provided value, more and more value to their life and, and they will reciprocate. So that's kind of, for me, the secret of, of social media is thinking about that handful of people and hoping that they can get you more. Um, or if you understand why your donors uh, came to your organization in the first place, if you can think of someone influential who has an audience with those types of people. Again, online is, is uh, developing that relationship with that influential people, person who has an audience um, that you need to get to. Um, but if you spray yourself too thin online, then you, you haven't allowed anybody and you haven't open it's a hockey night in Canada thing yeah I've heard, read your messages for 10 years da, 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 da. Um, so yeah so it's being, being relevant I mean, you got it being relevant but then finding um, wowing those people and uh, they will find you more um, it's a slow process but it can snowball for sure once it gets going Cool. Sure. We got another gentleman. Yes. Just a very short comment on John. There's a book called Winning the Story Wars uh, that yes. just came out. Uh, I think that really should be on your list for at least nonprofit and people with uh, story to tell. Yeah, you're great. That's great. Yeah, Winning the Story Wars. I believe Laurie's reading that. Jo uh, Jonah Sachs. Joe. Jo Jonah Sachs. Jonah Sachs. You can put it on our website. Yeah, that's great. It's not on my list yet because I haven't read it yet. 
So I haven't vetted it, but yes, I've, I've read the pre stuff. So yeah, that's a great, great one for sure. Okay, we have two more questions in the front. Yeah, I, I have a really short story. I think it's unique and special. And you're coming up to the front. Awesome. I love it. My name is Ron. I'm from Cyber Quality Free Geek. I'm an executive manager there. We're volunteer driven. The story is, is not really about our organization. It's about an experience I had when I lived in Quebec. I had a piece of property on a mountainside, which was forested, and it was at the end of the season, uh, and uh, it was in a semi-isolated area, and nobody was around on that particular day, and it was getting colder down around the freezing point. And because the mountainside was forested, uh, I was cutting logs to build a log cabin, a small log cabin. So I was there alone with my chainsaw and some food and whatever. And uh, so I, I sat down for a break. And, and, and the snowflake, big snowflakes were just starting to fall. And the name of the story is, I heard the snowflakes fall. A lot of people can't believe that you could hear that. But because of the leaves were so dry on the ground, there's a lot of dry leaves. And because the snowflakes were so big, okay, and because it was so quiet, because nobody was around, I, and because I was sitting low to the ground on a log, I could hear some of the snowflakes tinging off the leaves. And that's my story. It was, it was like really unusual, and it was about really being in the moment with nature. Mm. Great, thank you. <laughs> See? Yeah. That's an experience that I want to have. That's what I think the epitome of uh, where I'd love to be one day. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Oh. Great. Okay. You guys are awesome. So my name is Noel, and this time last year, I went to hike the Appalachian Trail, which goes from Georgia to Maine. It's over 2,300 miles. And pretty quickly, I noticed that the people that were also through hiking, there were a lot of people, especially from the 20 to 30-year-old range, who were out there because they hadn't found work in over six months. And they didn't want to put that on a resume, so they decided that they would go hike, and it would kind of fudge their resume a little bit. So I started asking them the question of, what is your opinion of Occupy Wall Street? And what was amazing about the story was that everybody had a different opinion, but I had heard all these stories on news outlets and, and the internet. And what I started noticing is, the best story is the one that people think is their opinion. So then I asked them, I said, well, let me tell you a story, and then you can tell me if you still agree or disagree with what your opinion was when you started. So imagine in this room, and this isn't to be sexist, so we'll just take this half on the right and this half on the left. So on the right, every morning, we live on an island, and we go out, and we go fishing with fishing poles. You guys stay at home or at the camp, and when we bring all the fish back, it's all put in, it's filleted up, and cooked and we all have a feast every night. And this has been going on for a thousand years. And all of a sudden one day, this boat shows up and on it are some missionaries. And they think that they're doing us a favor and they offer what they perceive as the chief, which will be you. <laughs> and they offer you a fishing net. And they're going to teach you how to use it. So you grab your little crew here and the four of you go out and learn how to fish with a fishing net. What's amazing though is you're able to cast that net out and in one or two casts you have enough fish for everybody. But we still want to go fishing so we go out there and we throw. But every day we catch fewer and fewer fish. Meanwhile you're pulling in a net load every time. And then all of a sudden you start to say, you know, you guys aren't working hard enough. You know, these are our fish. We are doing this. We're getting up early. And ultimately the fishing net has become the internet. And for the people who have gotten in early on the internet, they're collecting all the money, all the fish. And meanwhile, what's left are a bunch of people who have done what their parents did and their parents did for them. And they're all sitting there going, we want a piece of this. We want some of your fish. And the fact is, the media and the internet is at, at odds at who is right. Well, the fact is, this has been going on for thousands of years because there's always a new fishing net. There's always a new internet, and there will be again. 
It isn't about who owns the fish, it's what are we going to do with the rest of the people. When I asked the people on the trail that, they instantly knew the answer, which is, holy cow, we've got to think about everybody who used to work hard and get them back on track. So think about how your story can take a lot of different stories and be more powerful so that your charity can be the one that leads the way to the 21st century. Thanks. Can I not talk now and leave it at that? Because that was just awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Inspirational and memorable and hopefully spreadable. Um, okay, uh, we had another question. Okay, well, great. A really quick story. I always want to hear a quick story if you come to the front. Okay. I'm Nick. I work at Kids Health Phone. I do creative services there. And um, I like this story because it's directly connected to our service. And I heard it about two months after I started working at Kids Health Phone. And I've never forgotten it. Uh, and it's a true story. Um, so there was one night when a um, about a five or six year old kid uh, called into the line in um, the middle of the night and um, he didn't know where his mother was. His, uh, he had no idea. She had just disappeared and he was home alone at night and he was scared and he didn't know what to do so he had called us. And he said that the worst part about it was that it was his birthday and that there was nobody around to sing him happy birthday. And 30 seconds later, the counselor had gathered four more counselors, and five counselors stood around the phone and sang him happy birthday. Yeah. And that's why we do what we do, right? And that's the difference that we're making. And, uh, and people aren't hearing these stories, right? So the more that people can hear them, um, the more support we will have and uh, we can lead the way as the other gentleman talked about. It's great.